Hello, everyone. Um, hello, speakers. Um, this is the data set member meeting 2021 with the session, what is your resource type? Um, my name is Paul Fierkant. I'm the outreach manager at data site. And um, I'm your host or your, the chair of the session and uh, um, will guide you through this session. What will we do today in this uh, in the next hour? Um, we will have um, different speakers talking about what kind of resource types they use at their institution or what kind of use cases there they have. Um, we will be hearing um, uh, at the beginning Maria Priscillas from CDL, California Digital Library about data management plans. After that, uh, Brian Bockelman from Markridge Institute for Research will be talking about uh, the resource type software and how they use that or apply that. Um, followed by Elena Prezani from Archive uh, talking about preprints, how that obviously uh, preprints are dealt with at Archive. And last but not least, um, a couple of presenters will talk about uh, samples being um, uh, Mark Masella from uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, Kerstin representing IGSN, International Geo Sample Number, Jens Klump from CSIRO, and Matt Weiss from DataSite. So before we get started, uh, just want to introduce the discussion. Um, there you go. Uh, what actually a resource type is, and I just cited the the um, the current description that we have in uh, in the current uh, 4.4 version of the data submitted. This schema it's as simple as that. Uh, a description of the resource, and as you can see, there we now have 27 controlled values in the list of values um, um, for the resource uh, general resource types. And we recently added, as was mentioned also this morning, we recently added 13 new resource types uh, amongst which are more um, yeah, text-based uh, text resource types, but also output management plan, for instance, uh, as new, new resource types that will um, hopefully be covered in the future even more. Then um, the question is, what is your resource type? We asked that. Uh, we also asked in uh, the this morning session, uh, product roadmap and feedback session, but also in other sessions, what kind of um, um, resource types they would like to have. And you can see a tagline here that was created, created during that session. You can have get an idea of, of what uh, institutions or people think that would uh, be of use to their institutions. And um, and on the left, you see a screenshot of. of Today uh, of Fabrica, what kind of resource types are assigned to the different uh, resources? And as you can see within uh, uh, Fabrica, we have more than 11 million data sets, but also other uh, resource types, texts uh, and images, um, but also the new ones that uh, have been introduced, as I said, in version 4.4, they're taken up like a journal article um, or um, yeah, dissertation. So this is really, uh, a, a huge step this new version. And uh, if you also want to contribute, not only contribute to the discussion, but also be part of the metadata working group, uh, we invite you to join the metadata working group because there is currently a call for applications. So you can join that uh, uh, working group and um, really have influence on how the metadata schema and even resource types are um, developed in the future. So um, this is it from my side, and I would pass on the torch to um, Maria. So if you sh could share your screen. Alrighty, thanks everyone. Get my slides up. All right, um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the Brave New PID which I stole that um, title from a blog post that um, Matt and Chris John from Datasite used um, to announce the new DMP ID. Um, so we're gonna talk about just really briefly what's in the DMP, why did we think it was essential and important to add it to um, the PID infrastructure. We'll talk about how we're using DMP IDs uh, within the DMP tool on some integrations and partnerships that we're working on. And we'll talk a little bit about um, networks, DMPs, and connecting it to the larger scholarly ecosystem. 
Um, so first off, my name is Maria Pretelis, and I'm with the California Digital Library. So we're part of the University of California system. We work system wide with all of the UC campuses. I'm in the UC3 department where we work with maintaining, uh, preserving and adding value to digital research data. So my piece of that is research data management, but we also do work in other services that you've probably heard of, like uh, data publication with Dryad, persistent identifiers, ROAR that I'm sure most people are familiar with. We also work in digital preservation and data and software skills training with library carpentry. Uh, so one of the services that I manage is the DMP tool, and we are using DMP IDs, the new resource type, uh, within the DMP tool, and I'll talk about that today. Uh, the DMP tool is a free, open source, community-supported tool. We've been around for about 10 years now. We work on an open source code base that's jointly um, developed with a number of service providers around the world. Um, our closest partners are DCC out of the UK and they run DMP online. So with the, within the DMP tool lately, our main focus has been on creating next generation machine actionable data management plans. And a big piece of that is really around the use of identifiers and the new uh, DMP ID. So really briefly, what's in a DMP? There's a lot of really rich metadata and information about uh, data management and planning of research projects within a DMP. So traditionally, all this information uh, really wasn't utilized or harnessed. It was just a static, uh, usually two-page PDF document that a researcher would submit to their program officer and that was really the end of it. So all of the different stakeholders, um, you know, data repositories, um, grant administrators, um, field station directors, none, none of these people that are involved in research had access to or information, a way to retrieve the information that was in a good data management plan. So one of our first steps was to convert all of this text information into a structured document that we could share um, across systems. So really the goal of this work was to support the creation and importantly, the stewardship of fair data. Um, so a good machine actionable DMP can facilitate notifications and verification, reporting, compliance checking, and really, really importantly, um, this process and this, these new systems should lessen the administrative burden on researchers and grant administrators. So by sharing this information in a structured way, by utilizing identifiers, information can be shared across systems, reducing data duplication, where you're having to enter the same information in multiple systems, which we all know researchers do not like to do. Uh, so we've been working on this uh, for a number of years. Uh, we've had two NSF, uh, the National Science Foundation funded grants um, that were looking at this work. Our first grant was really getting us established in this space, um, converting the DMP tool so we can have structured files for DMPs. We built an API so we could exchange this information between systems. We worked closely with data sites to get the new resource type, the DMP ID that I'll talk about. So that grant just finished. We have a new grant also with NSF that I'll talk about today. That's called the Fair Island Grant. And really Fair Island builds on the infrastructure that we built in phase one. And now we're really taking that for a test drive, working specifically with field station administrators and testing out um, the really the impact, the effects of using good optimal um, data policy and machine actionable data management plans, all using the PID infrastructure. So I'm gonna talk about that um, briefly today. Um, so as I mentioned, identifiers, we all know they collect, they connect research activities. So one of our first things that we did in the DMP tool was to pitify the DMP. So that what I mean by this is we added identifiers wherever possible within the data management plan to facilitate exchange between systems in a structured format that could allow for these connections. So we did kind of the, the high level um, PIDs that applied across the board for all research projects. And now we're gonna be drilling down to some of the more domain specific identifiers um, going forward. 
Um, so the, the new metadata schema 4.4 was really big for us in the DMP world because this was uh, adding the new resource type um, output management plans, which we tried to future proof by keeping it kind of broad, but really this is da for data management plans. Um, and really from the beginning, we felt that adding identifiers for DMPs was fundamental for a good machine actionable data management plan because that allows us to access things like the event data service of data site so that we could make connections between the original data management plan and the subsequent outputs. So someone has plans to create specific data sets as a result of their work. We're able to connect the plan to those eventual data sets um, that are deposited into a repository upon completion. Um, and we really think that this is important um, because it allows us to connect pieces of the research landscape together. So I think that we know that PIDs already have the potential to enable connected research um, through the PID graph, but we really haven't had an opportunity to demonstrate what does that look like? What does it look like if through related identifiers, we can link the original plan to all of the outputs um, and really to enable discovery um, of connections. So this is um, a graphic um, that my colleague Erin Robinson, who is working on with me on the Fair Island project, um, we took a DMP, it's represented in the middle here, the, the purple dot, uh, and she made this nice GIF that shows you how the plan evolves over time using identifiers. So all of the um, uh, names on the left are representing ORCIDs. Those are all the people affiliated with this uh, DMP, all of the organizations, publications, and data sets. So as the, as the project continues over time, this graph gets larger. And within each of these outputs is all of the rich metadata that's contained within that specific identifier. So one of the projects we have with Fair Island is working closely with Datasite to come up with some new dashboards and visuals so that we can really demonstrate the power of these connections and the power of this network and how far out we can take it and what new connections we can make utilizing um, the PID graph. So each um, DMP ID, you can now um, uh, mint uh, DMP IDs in the DMP tool. When you, when you generate a DMP ID, it's given a landing page. This is within the uh, DMP tool system. It also has a landing page within Data Site Commons, um, which if I'm lucky, here it is here. I've already loaded it. This is the uh, data management plan as seen in Data Site Commons. You can see all of the connected data sets that are connected to this data management plan. Um, it also has uh, published journal articles that were connected to that plan. And this is all made possible through the use of related identifiers. If I can get back to presenting. So this is an example of what it looks like on the landing page on the DMP tool side. These are all of the articles that were eventually associated with this plan. So this would be, you know, that you make the plan a few years later as you start to publish articles and data sets, you can link them to your original plan. So I'm just going to talk really quickly about a few specific ways we're using the new DMP ID and we're trying to integrate with other services um, and really um, take a full advantage of this new identifier. Um, so one of the first things we did was we built an integration within the DMP tool with ORCID so that automatically when a researcher generates a DMP ID, um, it's automatically connected to their ORCID record and it shows up as a work within ORCID. Um, another project that we're working on right now and we just demoed for the first time um, yesterday at the Open Science Fair, that's an uh, integration with the electronic lab notebook R space. And so what we're doing is we're connecting, uh, integrating between DMP tool and R space. So it's really, um, for us, it's the first time we've ever been able to really connect the planning phase of a project with the active research phase. So by connecting these two applications, when a researcher deposits their data set in an external repository like Dryad, 
um, or Dataverse, that information is sent back to the DMP in the DMP tool, and we can we can record that that DOI was generated for the data set. Um, we do have a video demo. I'll show these slides. So if you're interested in seeing what that looks like, um, you can check out the demo. Um, the other final project that I mentioned briefly was the Fair Island project. This is our NSF funded grant project where we're looking at the combination of optimal um, open data policies and the use of machine actionable DMPs within a field station environment to see what happens when we can bring those two things together and really test out using machine actionable DMPs in a controlled research environment such as a field station and seeing what those effects are on advancing access to scientific research. So if you're interested in any things I've mentioned, um, we do blog about it on the DMP tool blog, um, or you can check out the Fair Island website, which is just fairisland.org. Um, and of course, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions as well. Thanks, Maria. Um, so far, um, there was one question whether the uh, data set method schema would be extended to practice research um, that was already answered in the chat um, and yeah so maybe we pass on the torch to brian so that we can um we are still on time and have a q a at the end hey everybody I'm uh, Brian Boxman I'm from the Mortgage Institute for Research. And as they say, uh, I'm not from here. Uh, so I, my background is actually in distributed scientific computing. So for, for about a decade or so, I've been working with the, the CMS experiment uh, at CERN to distribute its uh, computing needs uh, across the globe. Uh, as part of this, I, I help lead the, the OSG's uh, technology area. So OSG is actually a consortium of, of collaborations, campuses, national laboratories, and, and software providers uh, dedicated to advancing open science through distributed high throughput computing. Uh, so that's a, a bag of jargon and acronyms and, and words there. Uh, but what we, you know, the way I think about it is we take uh, people's workloads uh, that are amenable to a particular type of computing and try to Get them executed and get them done. So uh, recently uh, I joined the Mortgage Institute for Research and doing maybe a little bit less on the physics side and more uh, on the uh, broader scientific uh, side trying to help different uh, PIs and individuals uh, work toward uh, using the computing infrastructure. Uh, Particularly, our, our computing infrastructure uh, is about uh, one that has multiple pools. Uh, we overall do about 2 billion hours, but a lot of that is on dedicated resources for a particular project like the uh, big computing projects out of CERN. Uh, the open pool for uh, uh, the NSF software and engineering community uh, executes about one and a half million jobs per day across uh, 70 projects and 50 different sites. And in particular, that starts to get maybe why I'm here today, because uh, if you want to start moving your, your uh, data about, if you want to start executing your software across uh, 50 or 100 resources, uh, all of a sudden you start to think about portable software. And it's a relatively small logical leap to go from portable software uh, to reproducibility or, or citable software. Once you start taking your, your software and your environment off your laptop and move it to a server and then another server and then somebody else's server, uh, all of a sudden you start to think more and more about how do I preserve this and incorporate all the different dependencies and pieces of my scientific workflow. And in particular, I, I, especially over the last five years, have seen um, a huge uptake of scientists that have come and talked to us 
um, and start thinking and asking about uh, things like software excitability, how to, uh, uh, or software reproducibility. Uh, and you know, I, I think uh, basically any clueful journal these days at least starts asking for a scientist to provide some sort of uh, data, additional data record. Um, now that might start simply, uh, you know, maybe with the, the average scientists and even quite good scientists in their field might start with something like, here's a tarball, here's all the R scripts and maybe have some sort of link and a footnote uh, I've seen to, to people's uh, you know, home pages at their, their institutions. And uh, it's not exactly where we want them to be, <laughs> right? Uh, but let's, let's admit that the fact that people are starting to think about this and uh, starting to uh, work toward this area is, is much better than nothing. Um, and we kind of think of it, you know, maybe uh, particularly knowledgeable folks, people that we like, especially thinking of the, the audience here, uh, might do something like uh, take their notebook, uh, make sure that can be rerun and <laughs> reproduces the same figures as their paper, and, and submit their, their notebook as part of the data record of, of the paper. And that's, that's an accomplishment, right? Uh, th this is in the, the data site metadata. Uh, this is uh, something that people understand and can start to do on their own with the tools they have. It is unfortunately uh, not the end of things. Uh, so the notebook uh, or maybe their top level scripts that they use to produce the graphs uh, might only be the very top level that the users work. And often there's a set of libraries or, or workflows that that, uh, that notebook's sitting on top of. Uh, and to get the user to realize this is part of the reproducibility, part of uh, the citability discussion, uh, takes somebody with a little bit more of sophistication and interest. Uh, you know, first of all, did, this, did the user even use reasonable software development practices? Is it, is it code that is actually accessible and useful to folks that if, if somebody else read it. Um, did they deposit the software into an archive of some sort uh, that provide a persistent identifier? Uh, did they even provide not notes about uh, citation uh, and, and how to cite their software? And, and again, the good news is I, I think over in the, the last five years, uh, there's been a huge amount of uh, awareness uh, Software I've worked on, we've had people come up and say, how do I cite it? I, I noticed that you don't have this. Uh, if you guys have noticed recently, GitHub now actually has several different uh, easy to use ways to provide citation metadata. So that it, it really reduces the barrier for people who uh, maybe don't get as excited as, as the rest of us about uh, software citation and persistent identifiers. And, uh, you know, the, the barriers have gone down and the recognition that scientific software is an important part of, uh, of the scientific endeavor has gone up. So this is, this is all wonderful news, but uh, I am not here to pat ourselves on the back. I am here to talk about problems. Uh, so if the user takes all their software that they've written and their notebook, preserves it wonderfully, creates a DOI for it, make sure that everybody else can use it. Well, that's probably not enough, uh, particularly when it comes to reproducibility and, and particularly once you start talking about five or 10 years down the road. So modern software doesn't run by itself. It lives inside a incredibly fragile environment. Uh, these environments, uh, uh, to some extent, have gone the wrong direction. The number of dependencies or other pieces of software have gone up. And unlike the individual pieces of software, which you might be able to cite well, uh, the environment itself is, is really the wild west. How do you talk about the environment you ran your software in to, to produce things? Um, and, and in fact, this is one of the things that brought me here is not only uh, when you try talking about what is your environment and what was in your environment, 
how do you describe that and communicate that with folks that they even has uh, security implications. Uh, so uh, one thing I want to say is industry is not gonna save us. Uh, here's a, a uh, example of one of the most common uh, uh, machine learning frameworks, PyTorch, and all of its uh, dependencies for the first two levels. We don't train people in industry to make things reproducible, make things easy, or make things that are well citable. Uh, so this is a very common machine learning framework, yet trying to uncouple all the pieces in this environment is well beyond the skills of almost anyone here. And containers aren't going to save us, and they definitely won't save us alone. And particularly, I can't tell you how many times people said, here's my software, it's reproducible, you can get it from Docker Hub. And this became really apparent, and Docker starts announcing that they will be automatically deleting containers that haven't been used in the last six months. So there's a real need for an archive. There's real need for work in software citability. And particularly, there's needs for the environment. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll say that this is one thing that we're starting to tackle. Uh, we've been awarded uh, actually from the, the cyber infrastructure side of NSF uh, award to help uh, scientists improve uh, managing and making trustworthy software environments. And we specifically don't want to become an archive. So we're looking for people to work with and partner and to be able to train and tell people not only should you create usable software environments, but here's how you should make them uh, uh, citable, here's how you should make them visible, make them that they uh, 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 implement the fair standards. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brian, for this interesting talk. And um, yeah, we hand it over to Eleonora, um, who will present on um, archive and preprints, obviously. And um, maybe, Brian, you stop sharing and um, Nora is yeah. yours, Leonora, for the next 10 minutes. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, let me present. Okay. Yeah, so thanks uh, for uh, uh, for inviting me here to present. Uh, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit of our experience uh, in archive. Uh, uh, with uh, um, recording DOIs for preprint uh, with data site. And I'm going to start uh, quickly about uh, archive mission because I think this is an important uh, angle to see why it is so important for us to work with data site. So archive uh, exists since 1991 and uh, its mission has been always to help researcher uh, to access research quickly and conveniently. So they can uh, read uh, uh, new work and stay current uh, in a very uh, fast pacing way. They can share their uh, research uh, instantaneously. And ideally, this is something we are still working on, but ideally they also fulfill open access requirements from uh, uh, their funding bodies and, and government. Um, so in, 20, in, in 1991, the way that Archive has achieved this uh, is uh, creating this loop in which uh, the author submits their research article. We have uh, um, a network of uh, uh, volunteer moderators, uh, plus uh, some automated uh, systems that checks all the submissions. Uh, when uh, the submission is accepted, uh, it produces uh, a full text PDF that goes online. And also uh, emails are sent to all the subscribers uh, uh, of email lists around the world, and they can read it, they can build more uh, research and the loop uh, of happiness uh, uh, continues. So uh, what does it mean today? So the idea is always the same, a fast way for researchers to share and access research. But the way that uh, uh, it was set up in 1991 is uh, starting to uh, offer some challenges uh, in uh, 2021. And it's uh, um, archive records are not uh, uh, universally recognized for the career of uh, researchers. Uh, moderators are not recognized for their service to the community. Um, the metrics and analytics that uh, uh, are used for uh, the career of uh, researchers are only partially apl applicable to archive records. And there is an unclear relationship between 
archive and, and journals and funding bodies and things like that. So it's important that today archive records are getting connected to published material and that uh, uh, the, the role of archive in the published uh, landscape becomes clear so that both moderation and our authorship uh, is recognized, uh, um, is work that is recognized from the entire community and, uh, um, and archive is really interoperable with the rest. So how, uh, what is our vision? So how, how do we see archive developing in the future? Is a, a hub for curated scientific content, which is open, flexible, and interoperable. So that means uh, that if archive, uh, uh, if you see archive as a sort of, uh, uh, of market, uh, we have the scientific community that uh, has, uh, in the last 30 years, uh, uh, used uh, the, the material that is in this market. They create, they bring their own uh, fruit and vegetables and they, they share it with others uh, and uh, um, it works. Uh, but today there are also other archives uh, and also data and software repositories. So, so it's first of all important for both archive and the scientific community to interact with those as well. Um, and also we have um, uh, what I call enrichment services uh, uh, that uh, are things like a data site itself, uh, uh, ORCID, ROR, all the organizations that are helping us uh, to connect all the pieces together. And then there are uh, things that are even further in the, like the food chain, if you will, that are things like libraries, journals, aggregators that are using both of the content that they have in archives, uh, various archives, data and software repositories, enriched by the services such as DataSide, ORCID, and ROR, and eventually they serve it back to the community. So we want this, uh, this loop to be uh, more official in a way and, and, and easier to use. And basically what we are doing is that we are enlarging the loop, uh, that workflow that I showed before, uh, that before was just between archive and the scientific community. Now uh, it enclosed also other archives uh, and other services. So what archive has been using uh, from the beginning, from 1991 until uh, uh, 2007, um, is uh, a specific uh, ID that uh, was built based on the subject uh, where the article was posted and the date. This system was uh, somehow uh, uh, logic and easy to, to read from a human, but then uh, um, it offered also some challenges. Uh, so I, so sometimes uh, uh, article would change categories uh, or they would be uh, posted in multiple categories at the same time. Sometimes uh, one category uh, split, and so some articles uh, somehow uh, were moved in a different type of category. Also, if someone didn't really know the archive taxonomy, which is can can be confusing by itself, uh, would uh, yeah th this uh, number would not mean anything to them. And the main reason why this was uh, um, a problem was that it was limited to a maximum of uh, 1990, uh, uh, 999 monthly submissions and archive was starting to receive more than that. Uh, so uh, since April 2007, a new format has been chosen uh, in which there is no mention of the subject in itself, uh, but there is uh, it's constructed based on the, on the date. Uh, so you have the year, the month, uh, and then uh, a number that has uh, five digits, uh, and then also a version uh, because every record in archive uh, might have multiple versions of itself. So why, if we have already a good uh, uh, identifier, are we wanting to use uh, uh, DOIs? So the main reason is that uh, uh, DOIs is more than just a number. Uh, it comes uh, with uh, a metadata schema, and this is uh, super important for us uh, uh, because uh, the the uh, schema that the data site offers is well structured, but at the same time is also very flexible. So it allows uh, to, uh, to accommodate the needs uh, of archive today with the various types that we have. Uh, uh, of course, we want to leverage the new resource type preprints uh, and the relationship type uh, is published in so that uh, we can really follow the life 
of an article from preprint to publication, but it also offers uh, uh, the flexibility for future uh, needs of archive or for the different nature that we have uh, in archive. Sometimes we have published material directly in archive uh, or uh, student work or things that are not necessarily related to a, a preprint necessarily. And, and secondly, and equally importantly, uh, it allows us to join the entire ecosystem of publishing. So, uh, so data size supports integration with additional uh, PIDs, so we can connect easily to ORCID, ROR, and so on. Um, it, uh, uh, people can start uh, accessing archive data directly to data site APIs. So it will be even uh, furthering the, the access of the archive, the reach of access of archive. And uh, um, also we know that uh, for many researchers, uh, some of the problems that they have in having their work uh, recognized when it's posted on archive uh, is that uh, the systems in which they operate only accept DOIs. So sometimes uh, um, having a DOI is uh, sufficient for them to, uh, to have their work seen. And also other services like uh, linking services, aggregators, uh, uh, indexing services rely on DOIs to index uh, uh, the material. So um, hopefully with, uh, with this archive, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be a little bit more interoperable with all these uh, services. So how will uh, an archive look, uh, uh, archive UI look like? Uh, we can uh, uh, use, uh, you can start with the archive ID. So that is uh, somehow uh, our uh, holy grail. We want to keep that because uh, it has been successful so far and it uh, creates, it resolves always in a very unique uh, URL. Uh, but then we can use that uh, as a sort of uh, suffix uh, for uh, the DOI that we are building. So we can just uh, uh, take the, the, the prefix uh, that is a fixed number and then add the archive ID to it. Uh, and then uh, you will have the archive ID, ID. And then we can also save uh, the published DOI. So the DOI of the, of the published version of the article. And so uh, one uh, article will have uh, an archive ID, an archive DOI and a published DOI. So what it means in practice uh, is that uh, um, we will create, so we have an archive record that is basically what you see posted on archive. Uh, and this will, will have an archive identifier, an archive uh, DOI and a classification. So that means like a, a subject area associated with it. And then it will have an array of versions below it. So we will have this container that contains the archive record that will have a unique uh, DOI and then an array of versions. Uh, each of that uh, will have an archive, a versioned archive ID. And then it will have uh, all the metadata like title, authors, uh, affiliation, and, and so on and so forth. So in this way, we associated the DOI to the uh, root of the record and uh, uh, and then someone following that can then browse all the different versions uh, uh, within that record. And in order, could you wrap it up in one minute? Or yeah, so? because I think we so. have another. Thanks. It's basically finished. So the um, yeah, so these are some of the additional. Uh, information that uh, we will include in the new metadata schema. So we'll have ORCID, ROR, funding information, and so on. And then uh, as last slide, so what is next uh, is that uh, we are planning on implement the, the new metadata schema and uh, start recording new DOIs uh, uh, at the beginning of next year. And then the long-term plan is going to be to backfill be missing fields when possible and the DOIs for all the older records that we have. And we are going to do that thanks to a ERC grant that we are uh, using together with CERN that is going to help us. Cool, thanks Eleanor for this great presentation. I really love the loop of happiness and I will pass on to Matthew, I think, um, who will do or start the last presentation on samples. Yeah, thanks, um, Paul, and um, we'll try to get through this. I'll get through my bit fairly quickly because we have 
um, both uh, Marco from FAO and Jens from IGSN that will present a bit about their use cases. So I'll jump right in. Um, you heard before in some of the presentations a bit about our vision, and this is nothing new to anyone. So I'll skip through this really quickly, but really just uh, talking a bit about samples coming into the next in that we're looking to connect research, identifying knowledge and bringing these different pieces or research entities across the research life cycle together. Uh, the community um, continues to embrace new forms of these research entities. Um, samples, pre-registrations, protocols, data sets, and so new workflows and practices need to be developed to establish um, the openness, the connections between these, and ensuring the interoperability. Uh, the capacity to uniquely identify a sample is really critical for the community to gather this contextual information and also to interpret the related research data accordingly. Um, and uh, samples are this basic element for reference um, in a study experimentation in many scientific disciplines, and in particular, the disciplines listed here. Um, Matthew, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I don't see your slides. Oh, yes. Please Apologies share for, them. And thanks for letting me know. Uh, Thank you. There we go. Um, done that twice today. <laughs> Um, I, I, my second son was born last week, so obviously the sleepless nights are catching up with me a bit. <laughs> oh, um, samples registration, we have over 1.34 million uh, physical object IDs registered uh, by the data site members currently. Most of these have been registered by um, Marco at FAO, and so Marco also talked a bit about um, his use case. And we also, as you know, from the various communications, will be partnering with IGSN to register IGSN IDs. And Jens will share a bit about that work and uh, some of the work that we're doing. Um, over here is a bit about bringing communities and technology together, working through some of these conversations and a lot more work coming up in the uh, following uh, months and, and year um, around samples and what we do at uh, Datasite. Uh, some of the use cases, and I stole this from uh, the DMPID work that we did, are looking to uh, visualize and bring together these connections. So looking at a sample, looking at the related entities within the research lifecycle and bringing this all together um, in, in uh, the data site metadata store. And so that's a bit of a brief overview. And I wanted to skip through fairly quickly because the most important piece is hearing from Marco and Jens a bit about their use cases. And so I'll hand over to you, Marco. Thank you, Matt. Um, I have one slide my presentation is very long. Mm -hmm. So go grab a cup of coffee. Uh, the plant genetic resources community went through the same troubles as many others, uh, trying to put uh, meaning into some sort of concocted identifiers, so trying to disrupt as, as little as possible existing procedures. But then, considering that the plant genetic resources are massively exchanged worldwide, we have uh, well in excess of 1 million samples exchanged every year. Uh, we need to uniquely identify this material when they move from one collection to another. And the locally assigned identifiers that are known as uh, accession numbers are not enough uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, they simply do not work when taken out of the context of their own collection. So there is also the need to maintain the information about how this material came into being uh, when they are transferred from one collection to another or undeveloped with crossings or genetic modifications or selections or any other uh, process that are routinely used to produce new materials. So after a year and a half of consultation, we ended up adopting DOIs uh, and the DOI registration service that uh, is part of the global information system that the uh, uh, FAO treaty is developing was launched in October 2017. And since then, we have registered over 1.1 million DOIs with a physical object type. Uh, of course, we have our own metadata structure, which consists of uh, 
about 55 uh, elements. And we did an effort together with the, uh, metadata, the data site metadata group uh, to map this information to the data site uh, uh, metadata structure. Uh, as was said uh, in a presentation earlier today, we use uh, the related identifier property as metadata to provide access to the full description using our own metadata uh, in a variety of uh, formats, uh, JSON, XML, uh, Darwin Core Archive, uh, and, and others that are popular in our community. Uh, one of the reasons why the UIs were adopted was the uh, option of connecting the material DOI to the publication DOI and the dataset DOI so that we could easily identify research outputs that were related to our own material. Uh, we are still working on it. Uh, it is not working as we expected yet because there is a lot of resistance from uh, publishers, especially uh, because they don't like the way DOIs need to be cited at this time. Uh, to make uh, event data work, but we are more stubborn than them, so we will eventually prevail. Uh, we look forward to working with a GSN, and they will also be assigning uh, DOIs to physical samples. And we have uh, a fair amount of expertise in assigning physical samples to live organisms, uh, live organisms. Uh, so we hope there will be a fruitful collaboration with them. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. And um, I'll jump right across to Jens' slides um, to talk a bit about IGSN. Yes, thank you. Um, IGSN and DataSide share common ancestry, but for historical reasons started on different separate paths. Um, IGSN was developed as a discipline agnostic persistent identifier for material samples or physical samples. It also went through a um, pilot phase and then we recognize the need to build an international governance structure to run this system so this was incorporated in 2011 as a community of sample communities since then we have um, registered close to 10 million um, identifiers and these identifiers are designed to track material samples through their life cycle from the initial collection or creation through various analytical lab stages to then eventually be incorporated in publications and identified as objects and archives. So you can already see where there's the um, similarities to the use case we just heard from Marco. And what also was a a key feature of IGSN right from the start is that through the way it portrays relationships to other objects, you can portray the sample hierarchies of taking subsamples from a parent sample or in other ways described relationships between objects um, and also describe relationships to other um, research resources in the same way as um, you can use the related identifier element in the data set metadata, I just end use the same concept as the, kind of the mirror image to that. And because of that shared ancestry, I just end metadata and data set metadata align very well. There are some subtle differences that I don't have the time to go into, but one of the things that we did look into was the fact that when that for each data publication, there is at least an order of magnitude many more samples associated with that data with that data set. So when you look at the numbers of data sets that could be published, the potential number of identified objects related to those data sets could be enormous. So to say that this concept needs to scale to billions of identifiers in multiple communities, I think is a fair estimate. And IGSN developed concepts to allow, enable the discovery of samples at that scale. Next slide, please. So 
So, um, as I said, the two efforts, IGSN and data site started out separately, but related. And on the side of IGSN, we went through an exercise to find a way to build a sustainable long-term uh, organization. And the outcome of that was to um, work towards a partnership with data site. And uh, just yesterday, the IGSN General Assembly approved to enter this memorandum of agreement between those two organizations. And so in this memorandum of agreement, DataSite will host the technical infrastructure for IGSN ID registration services and the legacy handle system and support the aliasing of the existing IGSN ID handles to the registered IGSN ID DOIs. On the side of IGSN, um, we will focus on community developments. There's an IGSN partnership steering group to oversee the transition process and address outstanding technical issues. And what I find really exciting is that through this partnership, any data site member will be able and encouraged to use IGSN ID registration services to register samples without additional fees. On the side of IGSN, um, we will continue to, to develop this concept of community of communities. And this may result in offering additional services such as metadata management and sample discovery. So um, it's a very fresh development and something that I think has a really exciting future. And I'll hand back to Matt. Great, thanks, uh, Jens. Um, and I think that um, I'll hand over back to Paul and that um, is the end of the samples and presentation. But this is also an exciting um, new um, collaboration and a lot more work that we're also doing around all resource types, but also in particular around samples with the work with IDSN and continuing work with Marco and existing members. And so we really welcome um, collaboration over, over the coming year. Yes, thanks, Matt, Jens, and Marco for this presentation. And now we are right on time to uh, end this session. And I really invite you to the upcoming session of the Pitta World um, um, session that is together with Crossref, Orchid, and Roar. Um, there is a link, a registration link in the chat. And if you have any more questions for us for data site concerning PITs, whatever, um, feel free to post them in the pit forum um, so we can discuss there uh, online. And uh, thanks once more for joining and see you uh, in the next session. Bye.